Welcome back to part two of my two-part lore series for Homeworld Deserts of Karak. So in the last video, we had a brief introduction to Karak and its people. We discussed the histories of Kith Galcian and Kith Sidim, and took a look at the events of the Heresy Wars. And in this video, we are going to examine the histories of Kith Nabal, Kith Sajet, and we're going to discuss the formation of the Northern Coalition and the events that lead up into the campaign for Deserts of Karak. So without further ado, let's begin. During the Heresy Wars, the darkest age in the history of Karak, a brutal war raged across the entire Northern Hemisphere. As the Galcian and Sidim waged a bloody conflict rooted in opposing religious dogma, all Kithid suffered under the weight of their oppression. These harsh conditions would persist for nearly 300 years, and would lead to the most important revolution in the history of Karak. It was in the year of 810 KDS that a largely unknown group would emerge from a hidden enclave in the northern mountains. Kith Nabal, as they were called, would put an end to the heresy wars once and for all, and unite the people of Karak as never before, ushering in a new age of reason and progress. Not much is known about Kith Nabal prior to their dramatic emergence at the end of the Heresy Wars. What is known, however, is that in the years leading up to that great and terrible conflict, the entirety of Kith Nabal fled the growing insanity and established the great city of Tyr, hidden in a large valley deep within Karak's northernmost peaks. There are a few mentions of them in the records of the major Kithid of the first epoch, but the name Nabal only arises in terms of tradesmen or heretics. Kith Galcian were particularly vehement in their persecution of families under the Nabal flag, and there is some evidence that it was Galcian persecution that drove the Nabal to their hidden valley refuge. In the subsequent three centuries of chaos, Kith Nabal had almost completely cut off contact with the rest of Karak. Seeking only to preserve the acquired knowledge of Karak's civilization, Small parties were occasionally sent out to bring back texts that were in danger of destruction from the fighting. Sometimes these parties would even rescue scholars imprisoned for heresy. So it wasn't until Ifrit Nabal became Sa of the secret of Kith that a less isolated philosophy began to take hold. Ifrit realized that the wars were dangerously close to destroying the last of the infrastructure that kept the bulk of Karak's people alive. Under such an onslaught, the days of civilization were numbered. Though declared pacifists, much of the knowledge discovered and hoarded by Kith Nabal had direct military application. And so, when Ifrit Nabal Sa finally proposed intervention to his people, it took only a few years for a military force to be assembled. During this time, Karak had a largely pre-industrial civilization, armies waging war with blades and rudimentary projectile weapons. Nabal had been keeping the secrets of explosives and steam-driven machinery for more than 100 years. And so it was that Kith Nabal rose and swept forth from their hidden city of Tyr, steam-powered vehicles towing cannons that brought down the walls of despotic Kithid, while handfuls of soldiers, carrying repeater rifles and wearing hardened armor, moved to rout marauding armies 20 times their size. Ifrit, Nabal saw, spoke at every city village and holding his army liberated, offering those people all the fruits of Nabal's science and technology if only they would lay down their arms and stop the pointless destruction. Unlike the major powers of the Heresy Wars, the Nabal did not demand renunciation of former Kith ties. All they asked for was an ending. So the lesser Kithid, brutalized by nearly 300 years of war, gratefully accepted their offer, and soon the Nabal army had grown 50-fold with Kithid whose only desire was to end the heresy wars in any way they could. And in three short years they had done it. Ifrit Nabal's last act before stepping down as Sa was to establish the new diamond at Tyr as a place where all Kithid could gather for diplomacy. In the decades to follow, Nabal rebuilt the ruined infrastructure of Karak and improved upon it with their engineering and construction techniques. Any minor kith were accepted into Nabal if they wanted to learn new crafts or trades, and those same kith were then permitted to go their own way if they chose, and many of the major industrial kith of the modern world began under Nabal's wing. 
Over the next two centuries, Kith and the Ball continued to pursue their mastery of engineering, laying down the foundation for what would become the Northern Coalition, even giving Kith Pak II of the Southern Polar Region a permanent place in the Diamond. Now just as a brief aside, Kith Pak II was one of the major Kith that had also fled during the Heresy Wars. The entire Kith of 50 families uh, made a great migration all the way across the Great Central Desert and settled in the southern polar region of Karak. So though Kith Nabal seemed content to fade from the political spotlight for many years, their focus being on the continued improvement of Karak's infrastructure and logistical needs, recent events have steered them back to the forefront of politics. With the rapidly declining climate conditions uh, and encroaching desert sands on many settlements in the north, as well as increased hostility from Kith Galsian, the Nabal have once again assumed a prominent role of leadership within the coalition, forming close personal alliances with both Kith Soban and Kith Sajet. Now, Kith Sajet is something of an oddity among the power structures of the Kithid. While they are an ancient and respected Kith, whose expertise has ever been greatly valued by Kith Sa across Karak, they have never parlayed this influence into any real political power. The true power of Kith Sajet is in their methodical, detailed, and endless pursuit of the sciences. In ancient times, they were the first to plot the path of the planets in Karak's solar system and derive a calendar from them. They were the first to discover the 13-year progressive cycle of sandstorms that tear across the equator and predict where the rains that follow every cycle would fall. So due to their unmatched scientific knowledge and predictive skills, Kith Sajet has enjoyed a measure of immunity during times of war, as they were simply too valuable as advisors. And any Kith who killed or interrogated a Sajet was shunned by their science philosophers for a period of no less than 100 years. So it was during the Heresy Wars that certain Sajet vassals also lived under a secret secondary oath to Kith Nabal. These secret Nabal used Sajet immunity to move through the various warring factions and carry out missions of retrieval and intelligence gathering. Though any dual allegiance was strictly forbidden under punishment of sanctions and exile, the Sajet Kith Sa realized the extremity of the situation may have justified the betrayal, and in modern times, the bond between Sajet and Nabal is stronger than ever. Throughout the centuries, Kith Sajet has ever been on the forefront of science, and nearly all groundbreaking discoveries and advancement can be attributed to Sajet research. The time following the Nabal intervention has become known as the Age of Reason, and cooperative efforts between Kith Sajet and Kith Nabal have laid the foundation of the modern world, and ushered in an age of unprecedented growth and advancement. And, by the early 1000s, the Northern Coalition was born. With the Diamid having been relocated to Tyr, now the capital city of Karak, all Kithid, great and small, had a place to meet and decide on policies to govern global action. Technological advancement during the following 100 years was unprecedented, and by 1024, Karak's first orbital flight is launched. But the modern age is not without major problems. In the year 1057, Kith Sajet called a meeting of the Diamid to discuss the results of their first analysis of the northern desert flow patterns. Their studies revealed that the Great Barrier Mountains, which protected the northern polar region, would be overwhelmed within 100 years unless something changed. So that necessary change was made possible by the combined power of the coalition in the form of Project Stormbreaker, a grand ridge of sand baffle walls, a full kilometer wide and thousands of kilometers long that girdled the entire northern face of the Barrier Mountains. Designed to defend against more than sandstorms, the wall was fitted with a series of fire bases and command centers. Architectural planning and system design was provided by Kith Sajet, and Kith Nabal provided the engineering expertise for such a massive project. For all industrial and construction equipment, produced and placed the massive prefabricated sections, while Kith Somtaw doubled their mining output for the entire duration to keep her all factories equipped. Sadim legionaries provided security to the endless convoys, 
and Manan money and statesmanship kept the project moving. Project Stormbreaker was the largest cooperative effort in Karak's history and took nearly a decade to complete. But by the time it was finished, the Northern Coalition was set in stone. However, by the year 1068, analysis of data from environmental monitoring satellites have begun to paint a much more troubling picture of Karak's future. This data showed that the speed of the desert sands spreading globally was 10 times faster than surface observations suggested, and the natural aquifers were shrinking six times faster than initial predictions. At this rate, all surface water will have dried up within 200 years, and in less than 350 years by the most positive estimates, Karak will no longer be able to support life at all. So, with the grim reality of the situation, the northern Kithid began to look once again beyond Karak for salvation. With a network of satellites now in orbit, and manned spaceflights underway, a shocking string of discoveries were made. It was in one such manned spaceflight that crew members discovered a large field of debris floating in high orbit above Karak. After many spaceflights and retrievals, it was very clear that at least one, and perhaps several spacecraft of non-Karakian origin, had broken up in orbit. Technological breakthroughs happened in vast leaps and bounds from analyzing the composition and construction of this debris, but discovery of any intact or functional ship seemed an impossibility. In 1100 KDS, Kithsajet launched a new satellite network. Project Vincull was a series of potent deep-scan radar satellites capable of sweeping the space around Karak for hundreds of millions of kilometers. Six years later, in 1106, a discovery is, was made that would change the course of Karak's history forever. One of the deep-scan satellites had suffered a malfunction in its maneuvering thrusters, causing it to turn and face the planet repeatedly scanning vast swaths of Karak's equatorial region. The power of the radar scan had penetrated to almost 100 meters into the sand and had revealed a massive object buried in the heart of the equatorial desert. Something artificial was buried there, something enormous, made of metal and surrounded by stone masses built in regular geometric patterns. Further analysis of the data revealed that something inside this object had a power source and was emitting a signal at certain wavelengths that rivaled that of Karak's sun. Named the Jiraki object after the scientists that found the data, this anomaly then became the single most important object on Karak. Secondary data also showed hundreds of similar pieces of debris scattered all over Karak. So with the Galcian having declared a holy war upon the North for the crime of space travel, and the environmental data showing that their planet was indeed dying, the choice was clear. The Northern Coalition unanimously decided that retrieval and study of this Jiraki object was of the highest priority, and within months, Operation Skull Bree was launched. An Ifrit-class heavy carrier would lead an expedition into the Great Banded Desert to secure the Jiraki object. Named after the famed Nabal Kithsa who brought salvation to Karak by ending the heresy wars, the carrier Ifrit Nabal was launched. However, the expedition would not have the same success as its namesake. Within weeks of setting out, all contact with Tyr was lost. The carrier and its entire crew of 1,256 were never seen or heard from again. Despite the tragic loss of the Ifrit Nabal, the coalition could not accept failure. Operation Kadim was planned and took four years to reach completion. Operation Kadim would be led by less, no less than five of the new and improved Sakala class deep desert carriers. These five carriers, the Kapisi, the Sakala, Akalon, the Fiskir, and the Amida, would spearhead a full scale military incursion into Galcian territory to secure the Jiraki object and the future of all people on Karak. 
So this brings us to a close of part two of my two-part lore series uh, and has brought us right up to the beginning of the Deserts of Karak campaign. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll join me next week as we begin the campaign playthrough for Deserts of Karak. So if you guys like this video, smash that thumbs up button, hit that big red subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I will see you guys in the desert. Thanks for watching.